November 23, 1996. On a bright Addis Ababa morning, Ethiopian Airlines Flight 961 lifts off for what should be a routine trip to Nairobi. On board, a veteran captain with over 11,000 hours and three young men who will shatter every expectation of normal flight. Within minutes, a chilling ultimatum, fly to Australia or everyone dies. But the Boeing 767 carries barely enough fuel for three and a half hours, nowhere near what the hijackers demand. As fear spirals through the cabin and an impossible standoff unfolds at 30,000 feet, a countdown begins, one that leads inevitably to the waters of the Indian Ocean. How did a routine flight become one of history's most harrowing survival stories? Addis Ababa's Bowl International Airport was coming to life early that Saturday. The ground crew had already fueled the Boeing 767-260ER, registration ET-AIZ, with just enough for its first leg to Nairobi, about three and a half hours worth. That was standard procedure for this route. No excess, no waste, just the right amount for a two-hour hop plus reserves. The aircraft itself was a workhorse of Ethiopian Airlines, delivered new in 1987 with a reputation for reliability across Africa's challenging skies. In the cockpit, Captain Leo Labate ran through his checklists. At 42, he was one of the airline's most trusted pilots, with over 11,500 hours logged, more than 4,000 of those on the 767. His first officer, Jonas Makuria, was 34, steady under pressure, and brought more than 6,000 hours of experience. Together, they formed a practice team comfortable with both the aircraft and the route. The flight engineer, Shibeshi Melka, completed the trio up front. The cabin reflected the international mix that defined Ethiopian's network. Most passengers were Ethiopian, but the manifest included travelers from 35 countries, business people, tourists, families, embassy staff. The 12 crew members moved through their routines, safety briefings, galley checks, a few words with nervous flyers. Boarding was calm, with little to hint at the day ahead. As the doors closed, the 767's twin engines spooled up, pushing 175 souls and a carefully calculated fuel load skyward. Climb out was smooth, the city fading behind as blue sky opened ahead. The aircraft leveled at crews, with the crew settling into the rhythm of routine tasks, monitoring systems, logging times, adjusting navigation. The cabin lights dimmed, coffee and tea carts began to roll. On the surface, it was a textbook start. For Captain Abate, it was another line in the logbook, at least for now. At 0829 UTC, the atmosphere inside Flight 961 changed in an instant. Three men rose from their seats near the rear, pushing through the narrow aisle with purpose. One shouted, everybody should be seated, I have a bomb. The threat delivered in a mix of Amharic and English sent a ripple of fear through the cabin. Passengers froze. Crew members halted their service, eyes darting to the commotion. The hijackers, all in their mid-twenties and visibly agitated, made straight for the cockpit. Their weapons were improvised, a fire axe wrenched from its cabinet, a heavy extinguisher, and a liquor bottle wrapped in cloth claimed to be an explosive. First Officer Jonas Makuria was struck and dragged from the cockpit, blood running from a cut above his eye. The flight engineer was forced back, leaving Captain Leo Labate alone at the controls. The lead hijacker, slurring slightly from drink, announced over the PA that there were 11 of them on board. In reality, there were only three, but the bluff worked. Panic simmered beneath the surface. The hijacker's demand was clear, fly to Australia. They insisted they would blow up the plane if their instructions were not followed. Captain Abate tried to reason with them, pointing to the fuel gauges and calmly explaining the aircraft's limitations. But the hijackers, emboldened by whiskey and desperation, refused to listen. One jabbed at the in-flight magazine, quoting the Boeing 767's maximum range, misreading a promotional figure as a guarantee. The captain's explanations were brushed aside. The threat of violence hung over every exchange. The cabin, once filled with the quiet routines of a morning flight, now braced for the unknown. Crew and passengers sat rigidly in their seats, 
the hijacker's impossible demand hanging in the air. The clock had started on a crisis that would test every limit of the crew and the aircraft itself. Captain Abate studied the navigation display, his mind racing through options as the hijackers pressed for Australia. He knew the numbers. With less than four hours fuel, the Boeing 767 was nowhere near intercontinental range. Quietly, he began a calculated deviation, steering the aircraft toward the Comoros Islands, a cluster of volcanic landforms in the Indian Ocean, just within reach if every drop of fuel was stretched. The hijackers, distracted by their own bravado and the bottle they had seized, did not notice the subtle change in heading. On the radio, Nairobi Control pressed for answers. The captain's voice, calm but clipped, came through. Unable Australia, fuel endurance limited, request nearest suitable airport. The controller replied, you will not reach your destination with present fuel, suggest Mombasa for refueling. But the demand from behind was absolute, no stops, no compromise. Fuel gauges crept lower, digital numbers now a silent countdown. The Comoros, a thin thread of hope, appeared on the moving map, a final option before the ocean claimed the rest. Abate's plan was simple, get close enough to glide if the engines quit. The margin for error was razor thin. Every mile flown eastward, every minute spent negotiating, brought the aircraft closer to empty tanks and a forced descent far from land. The captain's resolve hardened. There would be no miracles in the math, only the precision of a pilot who knew both his airplane and his limits. Fuel gauges on the Boeing 767 had been dropping for hours, their digital numbers now little more than a warning. In the cockpit, Captain Leo Labate watched the right engine's EICAS indication flicker, then fade. At 11.41 UTC, the right engine flamed out. Starved of fuel, its turbines spun down to silence. The sudden loss of thrust jolted the aircraft, and with it came a new set of alarms. The left engine, already running on fumes, sputtered as the captain tried to coax out every last drop. For a moment, the only sound was the rush of wind past the fuselage and the urgent chime of cockpit warnings. With both engines at risk, the 767's emergency systems responded. The Ram Air Turbine, or RAT, deployed automatically beneath the belly using the slipstream to spin a small propeller that powered vital hydraulics and instruments. But the RAT could only do so much. It kept the basic controls alive, but left the crew without thrust, without flaps, and with only the most essential flight data. The cabin darkened, the air grew tense. Passengers began to realize the engines had gone quiet. The aircraft was now a glider, heavy and unpowered, losing altitude with every mile. Captain Abate gripped the yoke, fighting physics and time, knowing there was no going back, only the ocean ahead, and the faint hope of reaching land before the final descent. The left engine sputtered, then died, leaving the Boeing 767 gliding in silence over turquoise water. With every second, the aircraft lost precious altitude. In the cockpit, Captain Leo Labate fought to keep the nose level, his hands tense on the yoke. The only remaining power came from a small ram air turbine spinning beneath the fuselage, just enough to keep the most basic controls alive. But there was no thrust, no flaps, and no way to slow the descent. In the main cabin, a tourist's camera captured the impossible, a wide-body jet, engine silent, descending toward the Indian Ocean. The shoreline of Grande Comor grew larger in the windows. Passengers braced as the captain aimed for shallow water near the beach, where rescue might be possible. But the hijackers, still in the cockpit, grabbed at the controls, one of them yanking the yoke and kicking at the rudder pedals. The aircraft began to roll left. At 175 knots, the left wingtip struck the water first. The impact tore the engine from its pylon and ripped open the fuselage. The entire jet cartwheeled across the surface, breaking into three major sections in seconds. Inside, seats tore loose, water surged in, and the cabin filled with debris. Survivors would later recall a wall of noise, then darkness and cold as the sea rushed to claim the wreckage. For those still conscious, the struggle to escape was just beginning. 
Salt water poured in through the torn fuselage, turning the cabin into a maze of debris and rising water. Those who survived the initial impact found themselves fighting for breath, disoriented in the darkness. Panic set in as passengers struggled with seatbelts and tried to reach the nearest exit. Some, remembering the safety briefing, waited to inflate their life jackets until they escaped. Others, overwhelmed by fear, pulled the cords too soon. The inflated vests pinned them against the ceiling, trapping them as the water rose, a mistake that claimed dozens of lives in minutes. On shore, locals and tourists watching from the beach rushed to help. Fishermen launched their boats without hesitation, paddling out through the surf. French doctors on vacation set up makeshift triage on the sand, treating wounds and hypothermia as survivors staggered ashore. Franklin Huddle and his wife, battered but alive, credited their escape to quick thinking and luck. Leslie Ann Shedd, a young American, was last seen helping an elderly woman with her life jacket, her act of kindness remembered by those she tried to save. In total, 50 people were pulled from the wreckage or swam to safety in the first hour. For 125 others, rescue came too late. The toll was heavy, but among the survivors, stories of courage and selflessness would echo long after the waves had settled. On November 23, 1996, Ethiopian Airlines Flight 961 ended in the Indian Ocean with 125 lives lost and 50 survivors. Official records confirm the crew's repeated warnings that the Boeing 767 could not reach Australia, a fact ignored by the three hijackers. The cockpit voice recorder captured Captain Leo Labate's attempts to reason with them and his final efforts to ditch near the Comoros Islands. Survivor testimonies and amateur video footage documented the chaos of impact and the bravery of local rescuers. To this day, key questions remain, such as the hijackers' precise motives and the full details of their planning. The crash led to renewed safety protocols, including clearer crew training on hijacking scenarios and passenger education about life jackets. Yet the tragedy stands as a stark reminder even the best training and skill cannot always overcome desperate acts. Flight 961 story is preserved in official files, survivor accounts, and the memories of those who witnessed both profound loss and extraordinary survival.